All right, thanks for coming along, everybody. Today, I'm going to do the fourth and final video in the Ford Top Loader Four Speed Rebuild Series. And I'm gonna go through the final assembly of the gear train. In fact, I decided to change the counter gear as well because I found some dings and wear marks that had to do with, uh, I would say, low oil level. So, believe it or not, this whole transmission is gonna have all new parts. Very interesting. I found a new old stock gear. So, please subscribe to the video channel if you haven't already, the Gearbox Video Video channel. All the information about me, how to contact me, is in the description below. Please subscribe, hit the like buttons, notify me buttons, all that good stuff. Let's get to this video now. So, as we begin putting this top loader together, I just want to go over a few things. I polish all the shifter shafts, and I make sure that they fit in the board. They were marked, like this one was marked for reverse. Before I put the seals in, I just want to make sure that they're fitting okay, that they're nice and smooth, that everything is going together well. And they all fit really well, okay? I polish them, remove any nicks or dings, clean up the threads if they need to clean up. So we're not doing any of this stuff afterwards. Feels really good. So I'm going to go put some O-rings on these later. So in regards to thrust washers, I'm going to be reusing the old washers. I've already glued the real one in place. And I actually just use this anaerobic gasket maker and I just put a little bit of the dab of the gasket maker on the washer just like that and stick it in the case. That'll kind of hold the washer in place so it's ready to go when I put the cluster because the cluster gear is going to have to be dropped down and sitting in the bottom and then we're going to have to raise it back up. And also part of the sub assembly work. I've got needle bearings installed in the counter gear, front to back. Same thing, reverse idler. Just put the needles in like I did on the input shaft. So you just got to put as many as you can in there. That's all. You don't need to count them. Then what I'm going to do is, I use, by the way, just driven racing oil. It's the assembly grease for the engines. It works really well, actually. I find that it has a lot more tack than some of the transmission specific assembly greases. And you're going to just put the ends to cap all the needles with the little spaces that they have. The needle runs directly on the gear on the inside, and then there's a little spacer that you use for the ends. And that's ready to go. Same thing with the counter gear. Just put a little bit in there. And this stuff is pretty tacky, so we want that because we want to be able to have the gear kind of lay in the bottom of the case and the needles not fall out. So install new O-rings on the shifter shafts. They just kind of slide on. It's no big deal. So before you do anything, you want to start putting in your levers. Reverse lever first is down. Just be very careful that you don't cut the o-ring when you put them in. And the one two lever faces up and so does the three four lever. So next thing I'm going to do is put the reverse eyelid assembly in place and I'm going to just put the thrust washers in place. If you have to, you could use those nylon washers that come in kits on the reverse because there really isn't that much load on it. Now you got a roll pin over here that has to go into the case so the, the shaft doesn't rotate and spin in the case. Make sure you catch that correctly. And what I'm doing is I'm lining up that roll pin with the slot in the case. So now that's in place, we're going to put in the rail and fork. Now what I usually like to do is I like to drop the detent spring down in the bore for the reverse rail. 
and then I'll put the detent in through the side. I'll get in here. It's kind of hard to see, but I kind of fish the detent in through the side over here. I just put a, I use this file, I get it in there and get it started in the hole. So what I'm going to do now is put the reverse fork in, catch it on the arm, make sure of course that the detent, this is the detent section of the rail, the two notches is going to be facing below. This is going to line up obviously with the fork. Now because the way we took this thing out we had to kind of rotate this, what we're going to do is start to press it in with something long and then catch the rail. So I'm using this kind of long piece here, I'm going to go down into the piece going to press that detent down. I don't know how it can hold, show you, but I'm pressing it down as I catch it, you see? And then I'm going to have to rotate it now. And then the fork will line up with the hole for the set screw. By the way, if you can, use new set screws because they have a new nylon washer in them. There's really no torque spec for them, but just lock it down until you can't go anymore, all right? And it's a tapered pin, so it kind of will self-center on a rail and then just tighten up. Perfect. If you want, you can actually check the action, see? So I'm going to apply a little grease on these washes here. And then we're going to put the cluster in and just let it sink to the bottom of the case. All right, so I'm going to put the counter gear in. This is a heavy piece, all right? So it's really hard sometimes to <clears throat> get it in properly without maybe knocking the washes out. So I try to catch them as tight as I can without it kind of locking, because it's very hard to get, get it in here and then just kind of walk it down. It's good. And then I'm checking to see that my washes are still in place. This one's obviously in place there. And I can look inside the front <clears throat> and see if the other washer is in place. And that is as well. So we're good. All right, so the next step is to put in the bottom interlock. I'm going to put a little grease on the interlock so it doesn't go flying. I'm going to just stick it in the bottom like this. Put my finger on one end of the hole and then fish the interlock in. So the hardest part is getting everything to kind of fit in easily. Without taking your hands off and I got my thumb here, I'm holding it again, but I had this kind of zip tie in that I was hoping would hold the first gear from flying out, but it is, it would be good to have a two-man job doing this, all right? Now the main shaft is going to be loose in here, but it's a good way to catch the forks on the main shaft first before you put the rear bearing on in the input shaft. This way you have some movement to kind of float around here. So I'm going to put the forks in with the rails now. We're going to do the three, four fork first, then the one, two rail, and then put the rear bearing in, and then put the input shaft in, then raise the counter gear back up into place. Yeah, I think I got a better shot over here. So you can see what I'm doing is I've got the fork in here. I'm kind of lifting up the gear train to take the weight off the rail and I'm going to slide the rail through right to the middle where it goes. And the reason why I want to do this this way again is because I know you can do it some other different ways, but I like doing it this way because I want to be able to get the cluster lined up later on. Now what I'm doing is I'm looking in here to see that the fork is lined up with the hole in the rail and then I'm going to go put the screw in there. Now the two rail detents are the last things that I put in because I want to be able to move the gear train and float it around a bit.
Now we're gonna do the same thing with the, the one, two rail. I'm gonna put that interlock in that one, same way I did the other one. I can actually hold my fingers in the end here, drop it through. Sliding the one two rail in with the detent notches up. There we go. Now you see, what, because it's got the rails got to move around, I can get this in place now and then lock this one down. The whole way. So the bearing on the heater, we're going to see if we can catch it on here. That's nice. That feels like it's there. All right, so usually with these snap rings, they're very tight to get on. Try to walk the open end of the ring forward. Like this. These are very hard to get on. They're gonna get hung up in this scoop group, but you wanna kinda of pull it forward by the opening. So I'm making sure all the keys, it's nice and easy, floats nice and good, that they're all in the rings properly. And then what I'm going to do is put the fourth gear ring in place catch it in there, and then drop the input shaft in. Make sure my needles are all good. Relieve the load a little bit. So everything's nice and smooth now. Beautiful, huh? So now I'm gonna put the counter gear in place. Best way to do it is flip the case upside down to take the weight off the counter gear and let it lay against this gear train now that it's perfectly in place. And I know you guys can't see it, but I have a clear shot right through this whole thing now. And a lot of times too, with your fingers, you can actually feel, make sure that the needle bearings are all in place, that there's no space, that nothing's dropped out. All right, so before I put this shaft all the way in, what I'm going to do is put a little of this anaerobic uh, Permatex 518-13 sealant in the bore. Because these press fits are not really that tight. It's almost like a slip fit. And I'm always afraid that these are going to leak a little bit. So this will give you some extra protection. So here we got it, the unit's nice and free. Everything spins really good. And so what I like to do now is put on the extension housing, front bearing retainer, and do the detents last. Because you don't want to put the detents in and start moving the shafts and having everything pull itself out of the case. So before I can put the tail housing on, I have to put the speedometer gear in place. And the original speedometer gear was damaged. And it just takes a check ball to keep it from rotating and a snap ring. These gears, these new gears, are designed for clips that go on the flat side and a ball. So we're going to use the ball method here. Slide this piece on. They're going to go on tight, which is nice. May have to just tap them on a little bit.
So I got a brand new retainer. I installed the seal. Always grease the seals for two reasons. So the springs don't pop out and they're pretty lubricated when the transmission fires up. Also, I've got a triple lip seal that I use on the extension housing. Same thing. Sometimes I'll put some sealant around the outside diameter of the seal. I've done this in many of my videos just to make sure that no oil can leak past around the seal. So I'm putting new hardware in this transmission and on the extension housing bolts I put some anaerobic sealant on them and also on the gaskets. Holds them in place and acts as a great sealant for them. And I don't want to get any of that sealant on the rails, okay? I don't like squeezing the sealant on with a tube and a lot of people are going to say why aren't you using it just squeezing it in place because I want to put a very light coating of this stuff. I don't want it to be too much, you know, I just want a skin coat. So that's what I usually do, just use a skin coat around the, the gasket. Be careful too that when you put these extension housings on, you don't bang up the speedometer gear. It's very easy to do that. All the tail housing bolts get torqued down to 35 foot-pounds. I kind of go in a cross pattern. Upper left corner, lower right corner, upper right corner, lower left corner, and then center in the middle. Remember, all the bolts have to have some sealant on it, and you're good to go with the tail. It's a pretty simple installation. So one thing I like to do is just clean up all the excess sealant. If there's any that's exposed, I don't like sealant squeezing out of the case. I think it's very unprofessional. I see that all the time. So I just like to make sure everything is nice and clean looking when it's done. So I've got the front bearing retainer gasket on here. Anaerobic sealant on both sides of it. Some sealant on the bearing retainer. Oil return hole facing the bottom. So it matches that return hole over there. And line it up and put it in. Bolts all have sealant on them as well. Again, I'm using new hardware. It's a half inch head bolt. 5 16 coarse thread. The extension housing, by the way, was a 5 8 head bolt. 7 16 14 thread on it. Now, I don't like using the serrated bolts that they put on these, and I feel that they really damage the threads in the case. So I kind of always just start these manually first before I'll even run them in with a gun, just to make sure they're gonna go in okay in that cross thread. And it's a good practice to do that on any of these transmissions. Because they're so old, you don't know what people have done to them before. But that's good there. We're going to torque these down to 20 foot pounds. Oh, it's starting to really look pretty, huh? So, a lot of small parts kits do not include an 11 16th welch plug. So, welch plug, you want the concave surface of the plug facing outward. You're going to tap it in. Then, you're going to hit it in the, in the center so that it spreads out and locks into the case. All right, let's go put some detents in here. We're gonna put a little grease in the detent. Drop it in here. Then the spring. And the bolt. 
Now, also put some sealant on the on the bolt here, just a little bit. And before you start putting the top cover on this transmission or anything, you really want to make sure that the detent is working properly and that it's not too tight. You might have to trim the spring down or it might be some parts that the other person gave you. I know, don't forget, I got this transmission and it was really non-working. So I really have no idea how it's going to feel. But that's locked down. So a lot of people are probably going to ask me, why don't I use a magnet to put in the interlocks or detents? And you can, but you want to make sure that the magnet that you're using is smaller in diameter so it fits inside the hole. The problem is a lot of times if you're going to put in one of these things, you want to make sure it's kind of really centered like that on it, and you want to put it in. But then again, you have to be able to get it out, and a lot of times it's going to stick to it. On the interlocks that are in between the rails, you can kind of put it in and then hold something through the side of the bore and hold it in while you pull the magnet off of it. But this one here, just on the upper one, it's just a lot easier just to drop it in. Removing it, yes, you can put it in. You could take it out like that, okay? But put it in, just put it in like that. This is going to be the 1-2 detent, by the way. Put the spring in. This one on some, on some top loaders, they use a short spring with a screw that screws down and screw it down flush over here. And that's supposed to be enough pressure for the one to detent. Other top loaders, you're gonna see a long spring that's sticking up high and the covers would hold it in down. I like, I like this system better because at least you can control it a little bit if you wanna make it a little bit easier. Otherwise, you might have to cut the spring down to make it a little bit easy or tighter, whatever you wanna do. So I'm just screwing down this detent. So it's flush. If you screw it down too tight, you're going to lock the detent up. It's not going to move the rail. So this fits pretty good now. That feels good. All right, so I put a thin skin coat of Permatex 518-13th anaerobic sealant around the case. These cover gaskets are directional. All right, just want you to notice that. And on some covers, again, the spring is going to protrude through this hole over here. The cover acts like a vent. So there's some extra holes in here for the air to kind of come up, go around and come up the vent. And it kind of acts as a, like an oil baffle. Now there's some extra holes in here for some three speed applications as well, because the four top loaded three speed, the RAT and the RAN three speeds as they call them, are pretty much have the same sort of cover design. The, this top loader is called an RUG spec, which is typical of what they, the Ford designation was for those. So the RUG top loaders is overdrive top loaders in the same configuration. This is again a passenger car top loader. It is from a 67 Mustang. It's a wide ratio top loader with a 278 first speed gear. It's a nice street gear set. I love this ratio. The downside of top loaders is the gears are really big and very heavy, right? And sometimes they're not gonna really shift that good above 7,000 RPM at all. Because it's just the inertia of the gears is just too much. All right, this is gonna look so pretty. Everyone, if you notice the vent here, this is the vent, and if you notice, it doesn't go directly above an opening. The opening could be here or could use back here. The idea is, is that the cover and the gasket act as an oil baffle, all right? We're going to use some new hardware on this, too. These two bolts over here are the long bolts. All right, it's all buttoned up. These bolts are torqued down to 20 foot-pounds. These bolts, by the way, have a serration on the bottom edge of the flange over here. That helps lock the bolt to the top cover. There it is, looks really pretty. All right, so there you have it, everyone. 
four parts. I didn't think it was going to be four parts to do this video, but it is what it is. And I hope you got a lot out of it. If you want to get some more information on Ford Top Loaders, by the way, my book, How to Build and Modify High Performance Manual Transmissions, has a whole section on the Ford Top Loader, plus four other muscle car transmissions, plus standard transmission theory, some building basics. It's good overall if you want to learn about manual transmissions. It's available from my website with the links below and on Amazon. Thanks for watching, everyone. Feel free to subscribe, leave comments, all of that good stuff, and I'll see you soon. I forgot something. I forgot one thing. Very important. Got to put this on there.